QuickBooks Desktop 2023 Company Preferences Search Send Forms Service Connection Spelling Tax 1099 and Time and Expenses Options. Let's do it within two. It's QuickBooks Desktop 2023. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Here we are in QuickBooks desktop, get great guitars practice file we set up in a prior presentation, going through the preferences in the edit drop down preferences down at the bottom. Last time we left off with the sales tax. Now we're going to try to finish things off down here. Notice we're scrolling down a bit for the search, the send forms, the service connection, spelling tax 1099 and time and expenses. Go into the search item. You got the my preferences, not many options there. So we're going to go to the company preferences where it says QuickBooks desktop updates search information frequently. So changes as the company file can appear in search results. Select how often to update search information. So we got the search box preferences update automatically. That's the default update every 60 minutes. That's the default. Notice that it can be a little bit time consuming for the searches. So uh, if if it's running slow and you and and you want to get some work done and, and it's causing you a problem, possibly you can turn the search off for that time frame, possibly updating manually from time to time. Otherwise, we're going to keep it on the defaults. The note down here saying updates to search information can take a few minutes. QuickBooks may run slightly slower while it updates the search information send forms item down below we're going to start at the my preferences on the send forms where it says auto check the email later checkbox if customers preferred delivery method is email so meaning when you enter the forms such as an invoice it's going to check off the email later box which means that you're going to possibly send the form you know by email which is typically the case uh, these days oftentimes so use plain text format for email invoices and then it says send email using web mail so you could then try to set up or set up your web mail in uh, the quickbooks system within your account which could make it easier to basically be sending forms so that will be kind of a, a, a bit of a customization thing and then you got the quickbooks email where you could set up the quickbooks email so I'm not going to get into a, a, a lot of detail in terms of how you're actually going to be, you know, emailing the forms to clients, but just note that there's certain forms, of course, that are, are going to go out to clients and certain forms that are kind of internal forms. So for example, the invoice is clearly something that you would ship out to the client. The bill is, is typically something that will be an internal form because that's something that you are receiving from the client. You're entering the bill so that you can, you can basically record the transaction. The receive payment is usually going to be an internal kind of of document and so uh if you're giving the the form to the client then you could send it out by email and try to track it with the email or you might actually print the form possibly as a pdf and then send it as an email on an attachment uh, in that way you can also use other formats such as like a dropbox or something like that a cloud you know shared cloud drive or something like that so you can set up your options in terms of how you're going to be communicating this information to the clients in one way would be by email fairly common format these days okay let's go down to the service connection so we in the my preferences settings give me the option of saving a file whenever i download web connect data i'm going to go ahead and keep that on as the default and if quickbooks is run uh, by my browser don't close it after web connect is done once again i'm going to keep that on as the default 
How do you want to handle your connection to QuickBooks services? The following settings apply to all QuickBooks services except payroll and bank feeds. So those are going to be a little bit more complex or a little bit different because payroll has that add-on component and the bank feeds have that add extra components too. You don't have to pay more typically for the bank feeds, but you got to connect clearly to the to the banks with them. So automatically connect without asking for a password. That's the default. We're going to keep that always ask for a password before connecting so notice once again it says up here how do you want to handle your connections to quickbooks services some of those services might be things that you got to basically go online so you might need like an internet connection so it could say automatically connect without asking always ask for a password before connecting which might be a little bit more secure or safer way to do things or give you a little bit more control possibly uh, over things but make it a little bit more time consuming checked off here allow background downloading of service messages so again that could take a little bit more time because it's going to be downloading that information whenever it wants to download the information if things are running slow or something like that maybe you want to uncheck that if you want to have more control over things you can change those default settings but i'm going to keep the default settings here then we've got the spelling my preferences always check spelling before printing saving or sending support forms i think that's a good format to use however note that you could have things with the spelling when you're dealing with forms and items and invoices and stuff that are are just abbreviations that the system doesn't recognize so i still think it's good to have the spelling checked and then try to add those items uh, as things to ignore when as you enter data into the system so then we have the ignore words with internet addresses so if it's an internet address like has a www it's not going to give it a spell check uh, uh, thing a uh, number so that one's checked off if you have a number capitalized first letter like this if it's an i for intuit doesn't recognize the word then it still won't uh, ding it with a spell check because it looks like a name all uppercase letters so oftentimes you see things like an acronym asap and so that shouldn't be spell checked if you check that off and then mixed cases like quickbooks once again would kind of indicate that it's a name so you would think maybe the spell check wouldn't apply there so notice by default they only have the numbers checked off i'll keep the default so these are your custom added spelling words remove any that you don't want by clicking the check mark in the delete so then you can add items down here which are words that are saying hey don't don't give me a ding for the spell check with these uh these added words down below and as you're entering data into the data forms if it asks you and it says hey this there's an issue with the spelled word right here you can you can say generally ignore that or possibly you're going to say hey save that as something that you're not going to tell me that to spell check and so as you do your data input then those things that are possibly abbreviations if you don't check these off that you don't want to be hit with a spell check hopefully we'll be uh, compiling up here in our our words not to be hit with a spell check and that'll make things easier and more customized over time that's why i think it's kind of nice just to check off the numbers here so that it still spell checks some of these other things even though it's likely that those could be names and stuff because then then you can come up with your own customization possibly of the things that you do not want to be spell checked and that might make it a little bit more customizable and allow the spell check to catch a few more errors tax down here 1099 you got the my preferences and then we're in the company preferences do you file 1099 forms this is on by default notice in the united states then typically we have uh the 1099s is a tax reporting requirement so notice that we have income taxes that we that we got to deal with our own taxes and from an income tax perspective the government is going to want to know who's earning revenue clearly because those are the people that they want to be subject to the tax if you're the if you're the payer of the transaction the government has more leverage over the payer of the transaction because remember every business transaction has one side receiving income the other side having an expense for taxes everything's flipped on its head expenses are good income is bad 
So if you want to get a deduction for the expense that you're, that you're having when you give money to someone else for goods and services, spend money for goods and services, buy goods and services, the IRS is going to have some leverage to say, in certain instances, we would like you to tell us who you paid the money for. When are those instances going to be? Well, if they're employees, then you have to tell us who they are and you have to file a W-2, W-3s, 1099s, 1041s, 940s, and all that stuff. And you have to take their money and withhold it. But if they're not uh, W, if they're not employees, if they're large companies, the IRS is going to say, I'm not too worried about it, right? If they're large incorporated companies, not too worried about it because we already have other things to make sure that they, they do what we want, right? We're not, we're, you know, we've got them under our thumb already. But if they're small companies, independent contractors, we think they might try to fly under the radar and therefore we want you to rat them out, right? So that's what the 1099 is. So if you pay the 1099 and you've worked with the contractors, then you have to issue these 1099s. Now there's different reports. So whenever we have a vendor, someone we pay, we want to determine whether or not there's someone subject to a 1099 so that we can track how much we paid them so that we can then generate the 1099s for them so that we don't get the IRS upset with us and so on and so forth. Although the contractors could get upset with us. So we have to get their information and fill out the 1099s, but you get, that's just the way it works. Okay. So that's what we got to do there. So usually it's going to be on. So if you're ready to prepare your 1099s, include mapping accounts, uh, you can, uh, you can do it here. So at the end of the year, then you can, you can go here to kind of process the 1099s can help you to process the 1099s. And if you've determined all the people that are subject to the 1099s, then as you process it, you might be able to do that electronically, although you'd have to pay for it, or you can buy paper forms and use the forms within QuickBooks to fill out the 1099s, give a copy to the, the contractor, and then give a copy you know, to the government. So the two common 1099s, if you want to map your account uh, to boxes on form 1099-NEC, and then you've got 1099 miscellaneous. So most of the time people are using the NEC, with his, which is like other compensation for their contractors. That's the most common format of the 1099. Uh, it used to be that those, those other compensation was on the miscellaneous form a few years ago, but now they've made out a different form. So most people are gonna be basically using this, but you might have other things like rent income or something like that, that you have to record on the miscellaneous 1099. And, and so you can go through the setup process on how to, how to fill that information out. So those are those. We're gonna then go to the time and expense. Let's go to the my preferences, nothing in it. Company preferences, time tracking. Do you track time? The default is yes, we'll keep it on the time tracking. We've got time tracking component down here and there's two things with it. You might say, what am I using this for? It could be used for a couple different things. If you're tracking employee time or even your time, you might use it to process the payroll and help you to process that for hourly employees. But also if you have a job cost system, which could be a construction company, but it could also be a service company like a bookkeeping company, a CPA firm, an accounting firm that needs to charge whatever they did to the clients. You can use this tool to then create the invoice with. So we won't use it extensively here, but we'll take a, a look at it. And then we have the first day of the week. So when's the we're going to keep it on Monday for a, for a, a work week. Then we've got the invoicing options. Now I'm just gonna list these out and then explain them a bit more and then we'll get back in here in more detail. So we got the tracked reimbursed expenses as income. We've got the mark all expenses as billable, default markup percent, and then we've got the default markup account. So let's first think about what it means for something to be billable and the pros and cons of that. I'm gonna close this out for now. Now we'll get back into this in a little bit more detail at parts of the practice problem. But just to kind of recap it for these preferences right now, note that on the income statement, we have two things in essence, we've got income and expenses. The expenses are the things that we consumed, that we bought, that uh, in order to achieve the goal of revenue generation. The forms that we're gonna enter for the expenses will be a bill, a check typically, or we could enter time, which represents our time or our employee times that we expended in order to generate revenue 
revenue being recorded by invoices and the sales receipts. So you might have some situations, typically a job cost system, possibly a construction company, or like a service job cost system, like a CPA firm, accounting firm, bookkeeping, for example, where you're saying, I would like to have the things that I'm paying for, the supplies, the goods, or the gas, and this and that possibly, that I would like to apply to a particular uh, person or customer so that when I then create my invoice, I'm going to list out the things that I did for that particular customer down here. So that will help me to construct the invoice and invoice or bill in essence, the client for that information. One way you might think to do that is you might go, okay, let me go into my check as I write checks for stuff. I can go into here and say, I'm going to make it billable. So this is me writing a check to a vendor like the gas station or something. And I might say, I'd like to make it billable, which means I would like to then assign that or include this line item on the invoice of the customer when I bill the customer with an invoice. Billable here means invoiceable, right? Because it's an invoice in essence. And then we'd have to assign the customer. So we'll do this in the practice problem, but just to get an idea for these settings, if I close that out then, and then I create an invoice for that particular customer, I might get a pop-up saying, hey, there's a billable item that I can add down here. If it was gas, it would then charge the gas and it would add it down here, which is great. However, there are some limitations to that. And we'll get into more of that when we, when we do the example and part of the example problem. But one of the problems is that notice that these line items here on the invoice are usually driven by items that we set up in the lists, which we'll do in future presentations shortly, lists, item list. And so we usually set up our inventory and service items here. And those are the things that tell us which account we're going to be charged and how much, how much we're going to charge and so on and so forth. If we don't have an item for it, but it's just being driven from the expense, then the question for QuickBooks is, well, what account am I going to use to, to record the, what would normally be revenue for an invoice? Now, the default option, I believe, is like you could say, well, maybe I'm going to think of it as a reimbursement, meaning if I paid for gas, when I entered the check, it increased the, the gas expense, decreasing net income. And then when I record it on the invoice and the customer pays me, if I record it as a reimbursement, it's going to record a negative charge to the gas, to the expense account which results in the net income working out properly. But that's not usually what we want to have an invoice. Usually we want to have on the income statement revenue going up with whatever we, we generated for revenue and then expenses, revenue minus expenses being the net income. We don't usually want to say, well, there was an expense and then the customer reimbursed me for the expense. So the expense went back down and now I had no gas expense, right? Normally we want to say no. We had revenue, we had to expend gas in order to generate the revenue. Revenue minus expenses is the net income. So, so usually in the default, you kind of want to change the default so you, can, so you can make sure that it records as income. But even if it records at income, it's still a little bit limited because then it, has to, it doesn't know which income account to really go to. It's just going to be billable income, uh, generally the default account, because it doesn't have an item. So there's some limitations with that. We'll, we might dive more into that in the practice problem. But just know that's that's part of the idea here. And then when you enter your time down here, so if I was to enter my time or customer times, again, I can, I can enter a name uh, down here, the customer name, and I can make it billable. So once again, when I then charge for the invoice, it will then ask me if I want to charge for the time that had been entered. And this timesheet does have items that we can set up for the time so it can properly assign that out. So we might test that out in the future. So that's just a general idea so we can understand these settings. So if I go to the settings then, and I go to the time and the company preferences, notice down here it says track reimbursed expenses as income. I would think normally you would want to do that because if I don't do that, I think it's going to track those expenses as a negative expense account. And that to me is not normally the way you would want to do it. So you want to be careful when you're using that billable stuff to see how it's recorded on the income statement. Okay. And then down here, it says mark all expenses as, as billable. Normally I wouldn't mark all expenses as billable. I'm going to, I'm going to uncheck that. And then we've got the default markup percent. So note that if I had, 
if I paid for gas or whatever else and I had a job cost system, then I might say, hey, look, I paid $100 for gas and I'm charging you a 30% markup or something like that. That's what I'm, that's what I'm generating. That's what I'm earning from. So I might say I have a standard markup. This is what it costs. This is me marking it up. This is what I'm charging you for it. And then, and you could do that on a line by line item this way, or you might just say, I'm going to, I'm going to do that manually. I'm going to enter the invoice and then I'm going to, I'm going to mark the whole invoice up whatever 30% or my markup or something like that. So that would be that. And then the default markup account would generally be an income account for what you're charging because you're charging it to uh, an invoice here. So, okay. And then you got the track mileage. Now mileage, there's QuickBooks has some kind of fancy stuff with the mileage. Mileage becomes an issue because uh, for taxes, you could have a mileage rate that you're charging people and you might have like people driving that you're kind of reimbursing them for the mileage. So you might have a standard mileage rate that you're using uh, to charge them. We might get into this in more detail in the future, but notice just from a, because they have some kind of fancy options for tracking the mileage. They have an app that you can use to, to kind of track the mileage. But the thing you got to keep in mind is when for taxes, how are you how are you recording the auto expenses right because are you recording the actual expenses so that you're actually recording the gas and the maintenance and whatnot or for taxes are you going to are you going to use a mileage method where you're going to be tracking the the mileage and if you have employees that are that are that are uh, driving and whatnot and you're going to re reimburse them for mileage or charge an expense then what's the easiest way to enter that data into the system so you can learn a little bit more about some of the options for the tracking the mileage here. Just note from a tax perspective, you want to keep those in mind because you might be paying for gas and so on that you're recording into the system. But for taxes, for whatever reason, it might be easier to use the mileage method. So you might also have to be tracking the miles that you have over the year and your tax professional or you at the end of the year will have to make an adjustment and determine which would be the best way to go for taxes versus for your books to use a mileage method or to use uh, the actual expenses. So that gets into a whole nother kind of issue because of taxes. Taxes kind of create an issue there. So those are the general defaults. I'm going to go ahead and save that. And there it is.